podcasting to you from the beautiful Pacific Northwest. I'm your host, Brad Johnson. Welcome to The Theory of Wine. In today's podcast, we're going to meet Dave Cushman, president and winemaker of Park Farm Winery, located near Dubuque, Iowa. We're going to chat about changing careers from building stadiums to building a winery. We're going to talk about the largest AVA in the United States, learn about the Driftless area, and give some thought about the Bosch Funk. Stick around. Support for this podcast comes from the new documentary film, Wine Diamonds, Uncorking America's Heartland, streaming now at winediamondsfilm.com and from wineryboost.com, influence marketing for the wine industry. My guest, Dave Cushman, is a president and winemaker of Park Farm Winery, located in eastern Iowa, not far from the Mississippi River. Park Farm Winery was established in 2004 and is located about 20 minutes west of Dubuque and was created during the second wave of wineries opening in that state. Park Farm Winery is beautifully built with chateau-style features and is surrounded by vineyards, pastures, woodlands, evoking an old-world charm that perfectly complements their handcrafted artisan wines, making Park Farm a must-experience Midwest destination. Dave Cushman is a trained civil engineer and came back home to Iowa from Colorado to help manage the construction of Park Farm Winery and then began making wine in 2007. Dave Cushman, welcome to The Theory of Wine. Thanks for having me, Brad. Well, this is great. Dave, we've known each other for a while. Um, you know, I grew up kind of in the Midwest wine industry, and your yeah. winery was one of the first wineries that we'd visited when we first really started getting into wines back in, I think, 2006. We st- I started making wine. I think you guys started doing, you probably were under construction about that same time, weren't you? Yeah, we were uh, probably still finishing up. Until, well, we we opened in 24, but 2004, but yeah. Uh, um, Really didn't finish, finish till 2008. Okay. So parts of it were still under construction for a number of years there. Well, why don't you tell us your why, tell us your story. How'd you get into this? Well, I kind of uh, came into it uh, not through uh, conscious thought. It was uh, just kind of, uh, it just kind of happened. And so when I think back to it, I'm like, it's really interesting. But uh, um, after I left for college, my parents had got interested in growing a vineyard mm-hmm. and uh um, and it was really a happen chance for them. They, neither one of my parents were like big wine connoisseurs or anything like mm-hmm. that, but they had this property. They wanted to do something productive with it. Um, it uh, had, it, it was a pasture land for 40, 50 years and it kind of overgrown. And so um, looking through the different options, my mom actually just happened to be at a, um, at a local hardware store buying a tree <laughs> for their house and was talking to the person working there. And he said, well, I don't know much about trees, to be honest with you, but uh, anything you want to know about a grapevine, I'll be happy to tell you because uh, he was a viticulturist and that kind of took my mom aside and she was like, well, what are you doing over out here in the Midwest? This is probably in uh, like 97, 98. And uh, he, he happened to be helping, I think it was Wisconsin tobacco farmers convert to vineyards at hmm. the time. And, uh, and so he kind of explained to her how this, uh, there's this new thing going on in the Midwest, um, with, uh, um, people planting vineyards and getting into the wine industry. And she just, uh, thought this was like this coolest idea ever and went mm-hmm. and told my dad about it, who, uh, my dad's an engineer and, uh, was involved with a, uh, um, he's a partner in a manufacturing company and always wanted to do some sort of side business and like farming and stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, he kind of pushed this off at first, but it wasn't long after that that they saw some things in the paper, like if you're interested in growing grapes in the Midwest, uh, come to this seminar. And so my dad went to a couple of them and he got interested in it and started it. And so my involvement really, I kind of followed this from afar. I was finishing up college, um, civil engineering. Um, I always dreamed of working big construction, wanted to do like really big buildings or bridges and uh, took a job in Denver. My first job was building the Pepsi Center, mm. which Nuggets Avalanche Arena. Um, thought that was what I was going to do for the rest of my life, and uh, ended up uh, meeting my wife. We got married, um, then we had a baby on the way, and suddenly uh, um, all that stuff that when when you're real young and that seemed exciting and neat kind of changes. You have a priority shift in your head, mm-hmm. and. Uh, um, suddenly moving back to Iowa became a little bit more appealing, um, having some family around to help, uh, help, uh, raise a family, raise a family of our own. So long story short, uh, I 
my dad and I worked out an agreement where I came, would come back and help build the winery. And that was as far as it went at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I came back, um, uh, managed the construction of the winery. I was still fairly green. Um, I'd only been out of college for three or four years. So there was probably still a lot to learn from a construction management standpoint, but I got the job done. Um, and once that was finished, we had hired a winemaker who worked with us and, uh, um, I kind of stayed on as like general manager and uh, started becoming interested in the winemaking process. Um, I always find myself um, like very, very much attracted to new things. To um, I, I kind of have a tendency of an ADHD personality. So whatever's new kind of interests me and stuff. So uh, I got really got interested in the winemaking and I, and I was, uh, you know, the engineering background, it's, um, it's all about, uh, variables and limiting variables and working with those. And so the, you, there is a lot of application in, mm-hmm. in the winemaking. Um, and, uh, so after a couple of years, I felt comfortable, um, taking it over and, uh, um, ended up doing that in 2007. So it's been, uh, 11 years now, 11 vintages now that I've been, uh, making the wine and, um, learning a lot from, you know, both successes and, and failures, but, um, it's been, uh, you know, it's been a process and, uh, I should probably let you ask me some more questions. No, no, that's, this is, this is great. No, the people don't want to hear me. They want to hear about you, but I'm, I'm curious your, your learning curve about, you know, learning how to make wine and then the, the evolution of your winemaking knowledge and skills. How's, what's that been like for you? I mean, have, have you reached your, your, the kind of the epitome of winemaking for you yet? Or you think that's still ahead? I hope not. I, you know, I, uh, you know, things I, like I said in the beginning, um, or just a minute ago, I'm always interested by interested by what's new. Mm -hmm. And so I have a tendency also on the flip side to get bored Mm -hmm. with things that are the same. And, uh, so I would say through my winemaking process or my, as I've evolved as a winemaker, when I first started, um, it was all new and exciting. So I, um, developed all these, um, what I call strategies, you know, instead of like a recipe, right. per se, I would, I created like flow charts of like, if this, then do this type mm-hmm. thing. And that was a pretty useful tool in the beginning. And I had some pretty early successes. Um, and, but, uh, like it, it uh, I kind of became bored with it, I guess, mm-hmm. after a while and, um, um, started, uh, you know, just kind of doing the same thing over and over again. Um, I kind of fell into this period in the middle, I would say, where I wasn't really doing anything new. Mm-hmm. Um, I was, my interests were getting into other areas from winemaking and, um, I was still doing all the winemaking, but it was just kind of like, I was just doing it to get it done, right. so to speak. And, um, and then I would say like three or four years ago, I just kind of went through an inflection period or point where, um, I was, I was like, I, I, I'm not, we're not doing anything new. We need to start doing new things. Mm-hmm. And I started kind of re looking into all the new options and opportunities out there in the winemaking world. Mm-hmm. And there's quite a few um, things that have kind of popped up in the last, you know, eight to 10 years or things that I've become aware of sure. um, when it comes to like new yeast varieties, especially when you get into like non Saccharomyces yeast where you can get in and do like a pre fermentation and then your your real fermentation and then you have your post fermentation and develop uh, all these kind of new flavor profiles and characteristics in the wine Mm -hmm. and really start to kind of fine tune it and uh and so that's kind of reinvigorated a lot of what i've done the last couple of years and just in the last year i've really been experimenting with um like skin contact times Mm -hmm. and uh um, getting into uh utilizing uh, more enzymes and things instead of doing like cold soaks per se where we've i've had problems in the past where i've cold soaked wine or grapes and then i've had things get started in it that shouldn't have and uh and then you run down the path where you have wine that you don't really know what to do with where now i've kind of moved away from that use enzymes and these non-saccharomyces yeast strains to get going right away so that you always are in control of what's going on instead of like leaving things a little bit in the, um, you know, ether, I guess. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's interesting. I remember when I first began making wine, I was thinking, no, yeast is a yeast is a yeast. And that's as far from the truth as is anything about winemaking. Each, each yeast strain has its own special quality that it, I don't know what, it, what happens. There's magic happening in the ferment. Right. Um, 
uh, I mean, how? Because in the in the grapes that you're using aren't like traditional vinifera grapes either. So you're you're kind of going at this from like different yeast strains with new grapes. And how, how do you kind of get your feet underneath you? Yeah, it's. I say that's like one of the biggest challenges. Um, is we've got such we have so many opportunities that it's hard to like focus in on one thing. Mm-hmm. So we have a whole bunch. There's like twenty or thirty different grape varietals that we could be growing here. Mm-hmm. Um, nobody's like honed in and said, you know, this is the grape that we should be growing here. Right. Um, we're still like trying to distill that, figure mm-hmm. that out. And there's constantly new grape varietals that are being bred and introduced. And everyone's like, Oh, we're all excited about the new grape varietals. So we're planning that. Mm-hmm. And, um, and there's a, there's a very, there's a lot of opportunity to have a lack of focus. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so, you know, one year you're all excited about one grape varietal and then the next year it's another grape varietal. And then it's, um, using a, this yeast strain or that yeast strain. So it's, it's difficult to really try to fine tune it and figure out what, what should we really be doing to, uh, um, to move forward instead of just doing something, you know, different every year and really kind of spinning our tires in the mud, so to speak. Right, right. We kind of are discovering things, but are we really discovering things and then building upon them? Are we just discovering things and then discovering something else mm-hmm. and going down a totally different path? So kind of like how I'm talking right now, I think, but oh, no, uh, this, is, this is good. So yeah. <laughs> has there been any big, big, cause you use some of the, you use some of the older grapes like Marshall Foch, you know? Yeah. Probably well, I, I really like Foch actually. And you know, it has kind of a, um, you know, there's this rap about it, it that it's, um, you know, they call it the Foch funk, I guess. Um, that is, it's, I think it's very questionable whether that is a varietal characteristic or if it's a function of the uh, winemaking process. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I am finding that low, well, what, there's a couple characteristics about Foch that I think, uh, and so I'm going to divert for a minute and let's talk Perfect. about Foch because. Um, it's one that, uh, people planted early on. It was the main, that was the first red grape, I think planted in the area. And, uh, um, there's, there's some positive, there's, there's reasons it was planted in the area. It's got, it, it can grow here very well. It, um, it actually has fairly good chemistry, um, where the acids are lower than a lot of these varietals that are coming out of university of Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Um, it has very low tannins, and I think that's something that uh, um, has always been viewed as um, an issue with it. It uh, it also, I think, is v- quite variable from vineyard to vineyard, and I think that it has to do with um, it, it grows like a bush. Mm-hmm. So as the vine itself grows, it likes to shoot what's called laterals. So these are the these come off the base of of uh, leaves. And it, it has very much of a bush-like um, growing nature to it, which um, can shade out the fruit. And you get a lot of, um, you don't get a lot, you don't get a lot of sun exposure if you don't manage the vines properly. Mm-hmm. And I find that that influences a lot of the fruit composition flavors that come into the wine. So if you have a shaded out can- fruit canopy, you're going to have a much more herbaceous characteristic to the fruit. Mm-hmm. Um, the main what we, we did probably like six or seven years ago in the vineyard was um, th- what they tend to do with what, what, what the recommendations are for uh, like from the universities for Midwest vineyards is we have like high vigor. So the grapes like to grow way more than they need to. Mm-hmm. So, they, so they say put them on a high wire and point the main shoots down and that will suppress the vigor. And so um, and you won't have to manage it as much. The problem that I have with that is especially like on a varietal like Foch, it's very bushy, like is um, the, you know, a grapevine evolved to be a uh, forest, to grow in the forest. And so it always puts all of its energy at the highest point of the vine. And so when you put it on a high wire, all the fruit is up at the highest point of the vine and you point the main shoots down and then it starts shooting all of these laterals out up in the fruit zone, trying to go higher. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so you'll go through and you'll thin those laterals out and it looks beautiful. You'll have nice, uh, fruit exposure. And then two weeks later, you'll have a whole new set of laterals in there. And so it's, um, so the practicality from a vineyard standpoint of having that nice fruit exposure on the Foch gets to be difficult, mm-hmm. um, on a high wire. 
So we decided to flip it around and put it on a low wire and grow it up mm -hmm. and, um, and, and then hedge it and just keep hedging off the excess bigger. And uh, what we found is that after removing the laterals in the fruit zone the one time, the new laterals tended much more often to grow up high towards the top of the vine and stay out of that fruit zone. And so as long as we kept hedging it, we could get that nice fruit exposure. And so since we had done that, um, we saw a marked improvement in the quality of the, of the Foch then mm -hmm. in the, in the winery. So we, so there's, so there's that little, little nugget about Foch. Right. Um, and then in the winery, there's a couple other kind of things that make that grape unique. One is that it has double the seeds mm. of uh, most of the others. So it's like, and I'm not sure I've never really, I think there's eight seeds in a, in a, each Foch berry. So, um, so I think what happens, this is just a theory of mine is during the fermentation process, once the ethanol reaches a certain level, in the wine, those seeds start to crack open and release those seed oils into the into the wine. And I think that may be a contributing factor to what we would call the Foch funk. So um, we, what we do is um, we tend to do a shorter skin contact on the uh, on the wine during fermentation. And um, and I have no, I mean, we I, I would you'd say that we have very little of what would be called the Foch funk. I, I think Foch is actually very similar um, in nature to like Pinot Noir, especially lighter bodied Pinot Noirs that you would expect to come out of like Oregon, um, those places. I think that is the style where Foch shines the best. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we can make a really good um, product in that style. So anyway, that's just one example. And then there's like a million different varietals or at least 30 of them, maybe not right. quite a million, but 30 different varietals that we have to kind of sit and explore and try to come up with all the, the different things to make it, to make it work in this area. Right. So you, you have your own vineyard, you grow your own, some, some of your own grapes, but you also source out the, yes. the grapes that you grow. What, which ones are you growing? We go Marichal Foch, um, Marquette, and then we have La Crescent, um, La Crosse, a little bit of St. Pepin, and we've just planted Frontenac Gris, and we're going to plant um, some uh, Petite Pearl, mm. which is a new red varietal, mm -hmm. um, and some Itasca, which is a new white varietal. Mm -hmm. And so those are the those are the grapes that we have currently. Awesome. Yeah, I know some of these new grapes are having, I mean, again, every time this new grape comes out, it's a new big, next best thing. Um, right. I think it's cool that you've stuck with some of these older ones. Um, People have a certain impression of Iowa, right? I mean, if you go out of Iowa, you're either flying over to driving through it, and people have yeah. pretty distinct ideas. You guys are in a really quite a, a, a unique part of Iowa. And I mean, Iowa is unique all the way across the state. But tell us about your area and what makes it special for growing grapes and what makes well, it good. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the northeast northeast corner of Iowa um, is part of this called the Driftless Zone, which is an area that is untouched by the glacier drifts of uh, the last ice age. Mm. And it's a, I can't, it, 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 it encompasses like a very corner of Northeast Iowa, Southeast Minnesota, Southwest Wisconsin, and just a tip of uh, Northwest uh, Illinois. So, and it's all part of the uh, upper Mississippi river Valley. And um, the topography of the area is, I think uh, if for people that are familiar with wine regions across the world, it has a lot of similarities that they would recognize. There's um, there's rolling hills. Um, there's some rocky bluff outcroppings. Mm -hmm. The soil types um, it's like a heavy clay loam type soil. Uh, the uh, we 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 take advantage of the slopes um, for um, for growing the grapes uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that with the heavier clay, the uh, water it's it's good to be on the slope so that the water sheds off it when it rains instead of sits there and puddles up because mm -hmm. it's not like a sandy soil where it's going to drain really quickly mm -hmm. it um we also uh, use the slopes uh, to advantage during the spring for uh um, frost mitigation we're going to plant our vineyards up towards the top of the hills so that uh during, during frost events uh the uh, cold air tends to pool down at the bottom we've we've recorded 11 degree differential between our vineyard top in a valley floor at the bottom by our by our winery and so that i mean 
that saves us from having crops and no crops. Mm-hmm. And then you can take advantage of the, uh, the slopes, uh, by, um, from a soil, from the sun standpoint. So depending on the varietal, we'll plant them ideally like on a Southeast facing slope. But, um, in some cases we'll, we will, uh, do, uh, some North slope, uh, plantings for varietals that tend to like, like to wake up early in the spring mm-hmm. and uh, we'll plant them on those north slopes to try to delay that uh, bud break a little bit. Interesting. Which ones are those? Uh, well, Foch is uh, um, one that comes to mind uh, right off the top and Marquette's one too that would probably do well on a, on a north slope that uh, has a little shorter growing season and likes to wake up early. We'll be right back with the final half of our interview with Dave Cushman of Park Farm Winery. Hey, wine friends. Each week, the Theory of Wine will bring you interesting content from winemakers, wine growers, wine rebels, writers and bloggers, and serious wine nerds from around the world. Want to join us? Connect with us at theoryofwine.com, on Facebook, or Twitter. Cheers, friends. Cheers to the second season of the Theory of Wine podcast. You know we love the wine world and want to connect with interesting wine people. Got somebody in mind? Want to be on the show? Got a story idea? We'd love to hear from you. Drop us a note at theoryofwine.com on our Facebook and Twitter page at, at Theory of Wine. Cheers, wine friends. Welcome back to the second half of our interview with Park Farm Winery President and Winemaker Dave Cushman as we discuss the Upper Mississippi River Valley AVA, the local food movement, terroir, and making wines in Iowa, winery technology, and being a member of the Iowa Wine Trail. So I think people have this idea of Iowa being corn and soybeans, which, you know, in, in large part, there's a good chunk of the state that is. Right. But you're part of the, I mean, I remember driving up from Cedar Rapids and there's a little town called Strawberry Point. Yep. It's like you're in cornfields and all of a sudden the landscape dramatic, not not, not just like generally gently change it dramatically changes yeah. from kind of a plain to this beautiful rolling hills and forested valleys and it's just spectacularly beautiful up where you guys are yeah it it, it is and uh yeah it is dramatic too how i mean you only go a couple miles mm-hmm. you know and all of a sudden you're just flat right. and uh and that and that's total and that's due to the glacial drift um, yeah so i didn't i didn't realize that you know this driftless area i know there's a the, you guys have an ava there can you tell us about the ava and probably how it's related to the driftless area yeah the uh the ava i'm trying to think it's probably been around like five, well, maybe even longer maybe six or seven years now and um it's called the upper mississippi valley um ava it's the largest one in the united states so it's um it's probably one that um, in the future will be subdivided. Mm. My guess is that there'll be sub regions within it, gotcha. but, um, this was our first, you know, this was the first stab at it, mm-hmm. to get something established. And it's generally within the driftless area of the four States that I mentioned earlier. Okay. And, um, and so right now I think the ABA represents more potential than realized potential in the sense that, yes, we have this driftless area. We have, this area that it, it looks like it should be a good wine region just by the topography. You also look at uh, like the parallel lines. Of, if you draw a line across the globe and you look where we are, we're in close proximity to other major wine regions of the world, both in Europe and over in California um, and the Pacific coast and, um, and East coast. So there's a lot of things in our area that makes you, that would make one think that it has the potential for, you know, a wine region. I think what's kept us from, you know, why we're so far under, underdeveloped is mm-hmm. mainly the climate and the fact that we don't have a large body of water tempering mm-hmm. our winters or extending our growing season. So it's really kind of limited the uh, grape varietals that we can grow. And until like the last 20, 30 years, there was very, very little um, grape varietals that were even op- an option to grow in the area. Right. So, so when people think of wine, they tend to think of traditional wine growing regions. Um, you guys are really pioneering something, like maybe re-pioneering something back in the mid the Midwest again, uh, growing grapes. How are the how's the public responding to your winery and the wines that are coming out of your your part of the world? I would say that uh, we are 
probably we're not to the point where I would say we are an industry of it in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Like as there aren't people traveling to Dubuque County or the upper Mississippi Valley wine region for the specific purpose of sampling and tour. Now it's for sampling and trying wines. Now there's probably a few people out there that are, Mm -hmm. but it's a very small, it's not enough to um, maintain a, an industry so we're kind of like part of the tourism industry Mm -hmm. we're kind of an add-on to a trip you would come to the area for other things as well Mm -hmm. and um or if you're moving through the area and you have interest in wine you're going to stop and and check check these wineries out i would say it's been it's somewhat of a challenge and there's a paradox Mm -hmm. for wineries in the upper midwest in our area where like the local um consumers of wine like the hardcore diehard wine consumers are, are very, you know, suspect of the mm-hmm. local wine mm-hmm. and um, some will try it and some won't even try it. I, I remember uh, vividly a tasting I was at years ago. There was a, a guy that was going around trying wine and he pulls up our bottle and looks at it. Mm-hmm. And he's like, ah, I don't try anything that has Iowa on the label. Mm. Like, you don't even try it. You don't even want to see what it's about. And, uh, and so that's kind of one of the challenges that we're up against. And so when you look at, uh, you know, we're a business, we got to stay in business, we got to sell wine. The consumers that are more apt to buy our wine are ones that like the sweeter wines. Mm-hmm. And so we have this, uh, but, and, and so they, so there's a tendency to make sweet wine because that's what um, the people that are in the area are going to drink and buy from us mm-hmm. is the sweeter wine. Now, over the course of the last three to four years, we've really focused hard on making really solid, what I would call traditionally styled wines Mm -hmm. that are in the dry to off dry. And we're getting more and more people coming in and trying them. And it's kind of a word of mouth. It's very slow, Mm -hmm. but we're getting more and more people in trying the dry wines because I, in my opinion, in the long run, if we're going to be around as an industry and a business mm-hmm. it's got to be more in the traditionally styled wine because that's where the vast majority of wine drinkers really are mm-hmm. traditionally styled wines and so this you know last year i would say backing up for a second like 10 years ago we were 75 percent sweet wine 25 percent dry wine mm-hmm. and this last year we were about 50 50. okay so we're seeing it move i'm i mean and i'm actually starting to see some restaurants interested in carrying our wines mm-hmm. and um and that and, and like restaurants that carry traditional style wines and everything right and uh and so i think we're slowly you know turning the worm or whatever you however you yeah. want to put it. pushing so, pushing the string i don't know yeah, you know it, i've always i've always scratched my head you know because this local food movement has just been growing, growing growing and you know you talk about terroir if you want to be real serious about wine this is it's yeah. the it's the grapes and the com- community and the climate and the foods together and it's like these are the grapes that we're growing right here and who makes better pork than iowa right, right. i mean right you, you would think that there'd be this local food thing that's really embracing the local they do it with wine they do it with beer i think they're a little bit less uh they're a bit more reluctant to try with wines which i'm still scratching my head over any thoughts on that yeah it's um well you know it's kind of one of the the uh what makes wine unique from an alcoholic beverage, I guess, or beverages mm-hmm. in general, from like if you compare it to beer and spirits and everything, is that uh, wine is really tied to where the grapes came from. It's much more of a farmed product, where beer and distilled spirits are a little bit more manufactured product, where it's not such a big deal on where the where the ingredients came from. It, it is to a point, but they don't put on the label like um, are usually like you know, lo- made from locally grown mm-hmm. hops or weed or whatever. That's not, that's not the important part of, uh, of beer or uh, liquor. So it, it, but it is on wine. And so I think it's just wine is also a very heavy in the tradition industry. So if you look at like where wine came from, it, it, it was born like the modern wine was born out of a, over a thousand years of uh, French monks refining it. Mm-hmm. And it was very much based on tradition. It was before we, um, well, the, you know, they, the monasteries were kind of where science was born and everything. And, that's, and uh, 
but it, and it was based kind of on an exp, you know exploration and uh, what do I say experimentation, mm-hmm. and uh, but it was based on like thousand plus years of that, and it slowly developed over time, and so it I think it has such deep roots, and, um, and that that are based in tradition that it just takes a long time to establish new things uh, mm-hmm. in the in the in the wine world, especially when you get off into new varietals. Mm-hmm. You know, there's the five or six main vinifera varietals that everybody's aware of and knows of. But once you get off of that page, it gets really hard for the normal consumer to really know what's going on with that, what's in that bottle and stuff. Yeah, that's a good point. And so it's just, and I think part of it is just the consumer just is intimidated or doesn't know Mm -hmm. what they're buying when they, when they're, when they're getting one of these varietals that they're not familiar with. And part of it is just the deep traditions that uh, they need to um, be overcome or whatever. Right. So, so part, of, part of your job and your tasting room staff and people in the industry in, that, in your region in Iowa and the upper Midwest is as education. Um, right. Yeah, ab- absolutely. We're outreach, education, the, uh, the winery. All, all, I mean, that's our number one job, basically, in the tasting room is trying to educate the consumer as to what these new varietals. I mean, we have consumers, they come in every day and they would say, we like Chardonnay or we like uh, Cabernet or, or whatever. Um, after, uh, what was that movie a couple of years ago? Everybody wanted Pinot Noir. Oh, sure. And uh, uh, sideways. <laughs> and, but it's, it's, and, it, and it's as much of, that's just the only grape varietals they really even know. And they don't, and they don't want to sound like they don't know what they're talking about type thing. And so our job is to make them feel comfortable with the idea that you don't have to know all this. Mm-hmm. And, um, and this is, this is something fun. This is an, this is, a, you can explore this. There's all these new things to, to check out. We can, you don't have to be pigeonholed into just a couple varietals of wine. You can try, there's a whole bunch of different things to try. You know, that's, that's so interesting because even I'm out here in Woodinville, Washington, and we have, you know, 100 plus wineries just just down the road from where I'm living right now. And if I'm working in the tasting room and, you know, we have our Cabernet, we have our traditional, you know, the main the main stock of uh, vinifera. But if you get off, if you get off the, the text a little bit, you go to uh, to Tempranillo, for example, people are a little bit less familiar with that. The same sort of thing, education that we have to do with uh, the grapes that we did back in Iowa. We're doing here with the even even vinifera. So it's, it's interesting, the different sorts of conversations that one has in a tasting room. Like I was at a tasting room the other day and, you know, the, the conversation goes, it's, it's this percent cab, this percent Malbec, this percent Petit Verdot, and it's aged in French oak for this long. And then, you know, it's like, okay, that's interesting. That's a little bit different conversation than we would have back in a winery where, you know, kind of, I, I yeah. cut my teeth. Right. Right. Yeah. No, it's, uh, yeah, we, we, we're starting from like the beginning of what, of uh, these grapes were developed by University of Minnesota. These grapes were developed by Elmer Swenson, who was a grape breeder in Wisconsin back in the you know 60s and 70s. The, these grapes were developed by uh, Marischal Foch of the French Army in World War One. Yeah. And these are what we're growing here, and this is why we're growing them here. And uh, you know, it's 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 much it's we're a long ways from like the consumer really saying okay, I want to have a Foch or whatever, mm-hmm. or I want to have a Marquette. Um, what's your best Marquette or whatever? We're, right. we're trying to just tell them what, you know, no, we don't have a Cabernet and no cabs don't grow it in Iowa. Yeah. You it, know, so, Cabernet means it's a grape. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of the cool thing though, you know, cause I, I you know, have, we have Psalms, you have people that are really studying wine and this, this shows like letting people that are maybe less familiar with these, you know, new grape varieties, learn a little bit more about that. Have, have you found like wine consumers, the ones that are kind of consistent consumers of your, your wines, are they, are they staying with the wines that you guys are, are making or are they using that as a platform to jump off and try other ones? Or are they really dedicated to your guys' wines? How does that work? Do you know? Well, we have, um, we've got our loyal following that's kind of local. And then we have, we've just actually in the last year, developed like an e-commerce site where we can actually start tracking people that have come from other areas that then are reordering wine. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we're in the extreme infancy stage of really un- knowing how like deep our talons are into our, mm-hmm. our customers. And, uh, but, uh, we definitely have our, uh, repeat 
customers. And, and it's a question to me on, are they coming for the wine? Are they coming for the experience of the, of the location that we are? One of the, one of the things, like I, I said earlier, is that we aren't an industry of itself where we can just make wine and have people come drink wine and that would provide enough income for us to be a business. So we have other hooks to get people out to the winery name like our big thing that we started six or seven years ago is we also do a wood fire pizza mm-hmm. and so that's really kind of become business of in and of itself we sell a lot of wine as through the pizza mm-hmm. and it's quite and to me it's a big question is are people coming for the pizza and they're having a bottle of wine or are they coming for the wine and having a pizza and i think it's a little bit of both that's interesting but but it is we're, we're, we're still like really early on in like, I think developing like the wine, the true like wine connoisseur mm-hmm. customer base. Mm-hmm. And it's really right now it's like create all these hooks, give people reasons to come out here and hopefully eventually we can really build up the wine segment component of the business and create, you know, get that, get that to a point where it will stand on its own. Right. So I, we kind of touched on a little bit about, you know, how you approach winemaking. I'm just kind of maybe hit it directly on is about the philosophy of winemaking with you and at part, you know, what, what is your basically winemaking philosophy? Um, I, so let's see here. That's a, so I, I call it more of a strategy, I guess, than a philosophy. Okay. Um, I like to um, do things, you know, traditionally, and I, I, I kind of, it's, it's a, I guess it's a balance is how I would say mm-hmm. is um, I'm looking for, you know, new and better ways to do things, with, but I'm also uh, cognizant of what, you know, all the things that have happened in the past that, uh, um, that we can build upon. You know, I like to use technology and mechanic, mechanical things wherever possible. So mm-hmm. um, like I'm probably one of the smallest wineries in the country that has a crossbow filter. Oh, nice. And, and we also have like a mechanical pruner and, and things like that. And we're, we're, so we're trying to leverage technology and things where we can and, but not do it strictly all mechanical, um, strictly all manufactured, um, have as much hands on as we can as well. It's, it's, it's just trying to find the balance of where we can leverage things to the, that, that make the most sense. So and, you, I'm sorry. Good. Well, go ahead. Yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm curious because and I know everybody's not super familiar with all the tools that we use in the winery. But you mentioned cross flow filtration. Can you give us kind of a, a quick one one on that? Well, it so um, like most small wineries are going to use what's called a pad filter, and uh, that's uh, essentially where you put uh, these pads in between frame plate frame filter. Mm-hmm. Where you put these pads in between the plates, and um, the plaid the pads have different. Uh, that they'll allow different particle sizes to be trapped or to pass through. And so you, you will, you know, first do a coarse filter and then you'll step it down into the point where you get down to what's normally in the industry, we would call a 0.45 micron, which is where you're filtering out all the remaining yeast and bacteria that may be in the wine. And then you go through and do your sterile filter right at bottling. Mm-hmm. And so like a typical pad filter run would, you may run it, run the wine through the pad filter two to three times and during that process, you're going to be, you'll introduce a little bit of oxygen. You can introduce some water through the cleaning of the pad filter. You can, um, you'll lose some wine. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so there's all that. The cross flow is a single pass where you have a, a filter, And then you also throw those pads out when you're finished mm-hmm. with them. So the cross flow filter, it's, it's a filter that has a cartridge that has basically, it looks like hollow spaghetti tubes mm-hmm. and the unfiltered wine goes on the inside of those spaghetti tubes and the filtered wine gets filtered out tangentially so it goes out um, basically perpendicular to the flow of the wine and um, and then it keeps circulating the wine through that loop or through these these spaghetti tubes until all the wine is through it Mm -hmm. and on a single pass you can take a you know a cloudy wine all the way down to a bottle ready Mm -hmm. uh, wine so it's a single pass very little oxygen Um, the wine's treated much more uh, gently than, a, than the pad filter. Um, and you have less of a bottling loss. And usually it's a faster process. So it's mm-hmm. a single, you know, you set it up and you do one wine. If, you get, if you're really organized, you can do multiple wines just right in a row. Right. Kind of set, your, set the filter up. And for a wall, small winery like me, you get, you know, get 
50% of my filtering done over a course of a couple of weeks for the wow. year. And, and I think it, it produces a better quality wine also at the, yeah. at the end. So that's, that's one thing where I, I like, I like to leverage the technology where I can mm-hmm. on the flip side, like for our fermentations, we do all of our fermentations, very small. We, right now we do them in macro bins, small lot fermentations. We we're pressing or we're punching them down by hand every day where I can be in there kind of checking the process of the fermentation on a daily basis or even a couple of times a day and very small hands-on type thing, kind of stuff that's been going on forever yep. in, the, in the wine world. That's kind of on the flip side. I, I also like to use barrels. Um, like traditionally, mm-hmm. um, if you look at a lot of like new wine production, they'll use oak chips or staves mm-hmm. and tanks with microoxidation and all that. Right. I like to use barrels. I just, I, I feel like I can pick out a wine that's been stave aged over barrel aged yeah. like 90% of the time. And I just, I really prefer a barrel aged wine. So we go out and we get premium French oak and we'll get some American oak also um, barrels to age our wines in. And, and then we rotate those. So we always have new barrels and the barrels are more than just for show, I guess, at our winery. They really do. They're really part of a program that's uh, part of enhancing the wine. Right. So. You know, getting in the wine business isn't, 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 um, well, you can, you can do it on the cheap ish, but yeah. when, you, when you invest in cross flow filtration, when you invest in barrels that cost anywhere from 700 to $2,300 each, yeah. it's a, it's a major long-term investment and it really pays off, I think, in the quality of wines that wineries are making. So, you know, that's, that's, that's to you guys for your, your, your dedication to make an excellent wine. Um, I want to kind of get closer to the end here. Um, you are your winery and you in particular, you're the president of the Iowa wine trail. It's yeah, an yeah. organization of several wineries in Eastern Iowa. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So the Iowa wine trail, I think that was a first wine trail. It was put together in Iowa. Um, it was, uh, it was our first event was actually a half a year before we officially opened as a winery. So I think it was in 2000 and well, it would have been spring or fall of 2004. We were still just a shell of a winery. I remember it uh, um, vividly. We had people coming out. I think our roof had been on for like two weeks and there weren't windows or anything. Hmm. It's a uh, right now we have nine member wineries. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the, the uh, stipulations to be a member winery is that you're within the ABA, the ABA we mentioned earlier, the Upper Mississippi River Valley ABA, and you're in you're in Iowa, and you're dedicated to producing uh, grapes or producing wine from grapes that grow in the region. Mm-hmm. So right now, the Wine Trail basically has a couple events a year that we use to try to get people out and about to the wineries. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I see kind of a long term vision for the trail is to really focus on doing things that maybe we as individual wineries just either don't have time or focus for because we're kind of in the middle of doing everything else. Right. And that's, you know, raising the awareness of the grape varietals that grow in our region, mm-hmm. why this region's unique and, um, and focusing on those things where we can, like my dream is that in 15, 10 to 15 years or 20 years from now, mm-hmm. the at least people in the area will have a good idea when they look at a bottle of wine and see one of our local grape varietals on that bottle of wine, that they know what's in that bottle of wine mm-hmm. that, um, without never, without necessarily having tasted that wine in the past, they have an idea that that wine has a certain style and flavor profile. And it's one that they are seeking out and, and going after. And I think that's something that the Iowa wine trail, like as a bigger organization can work towards mm-hmm. probably better than individual we as individual wineries can so that's awesome is there anything we haven't spoken about that needs to be brought out and this is a chance to kind of do a last minute pitch <laughs> <laughs> well i don't know i, I think uh one of the thing one of the new uh things that i'm excited about with with park farm is that we'll be releasing um a new these our reds our dry reds are going to be coming off um as series now where we're going to take a series where it's the same grape varietal with different skin contacts mm. and so uh the first series that will be released in probably well it depends on this government shutdown because the labels are at the ttb for approval but uh mm. um it's scheduled to come out in february um it'll be called our prairie series and it's going to be all marichal foch and we're going to have a rosé 
um, what we're calling a noir, which is a light skin contact, only three day skin contact, and then a reserve, which is a, a more heavy skin contact. And I am just really excited about getting these wines out there because they are radically different and they're from the exact same fruit. It's really just the skin contact that's different. And that's it's cool. going to be really cool and fun for people in the tasting room to, to taste these kind of side by side. And our long-term goal is to expand this series into other varietals. We're going to add the Marquette next year, and we're going to call that our Arrowhead series, where we're going to have the same thing with the Rosé, a light skin contact noir, and then a heavy skin contact reserve. And so my long-term goal is eventually you'll be able to do flights in a sense of you'll be able to do a varietal flight and taste different skin contact levels or you'll be able to do a cross varietal flight of the same skin contact and notice and do the differences. And so it'll be, it'll be really neat and fun for uh, the consumer and for us as a winery to really explore all the different variables and options that are coming out with these, uh, these, these grape varietals. So. You know, I, I love the creativity of Midwestern um, winemakers. You guys are at the, at the, forefront and the cutting edge of uh, making some really cool stuff happen. Dave Cushman, thank you so much for uh, talking with us today. Thank you, Brad. It was a pleasure. Dave Cushman is a president and winemaker of Park Farm Winery, located in eastern Iowa, about 20 minutes west of Dubuque. Want to know more about Park Farm Winery? Check out their website, parkfarmwinery.com. I'll post links to their website and contact information on my theoryofwine.com blog. Hey, wine friends. Thanks for hanging out with us for Theory of Wine podcast, brought to you by a new wine documentary called Wine Diamonds, Uncorking America's Heartland, now available online at winediamondsfilm.com and winerybooze.com, influence marketing for the wine industry. Thanks for listening, downloading, and sharing us. Find us at theoryofwine.com. See you next time. Cheers, friends.